Uh, I was in compiler development when Guido was developing Python, and a mutual acquaintance, Steve Majeski, sent me some email telling me about Python. So I started a email correspondence with Guido about the language and about the design, and I got some of the pre-release code and played with it and talked to him about design decisions and it liked like it very much. 90s. Pardon? It was like in the early 90s. Early 90s, yeah. Back around Python 0.9.1. Wow. That was before classes were in the language. Uh, the equal sign was used for both comparison and assignment. <laughs> there were a lot of differences from the, from the language Python is today. And that's how I got into Python, and I've been working on the core development ever since. Right. And that means that, like, uh, I mean, how did you get to know Guido? Guido was just, like, he was an Amsterdam minister, right? Yeah, he was. That's the magic of email. Ah, uh, right. Even yeah, we sent email back and forth. I didn't meet Guido for at least seven years. Oh, really? Right. So, like, 97, 96? Something like that. I was living in the Boston area, and he came for a uh, business trip. And that's the first time we met, and we just had dinner. And I met him a few times after that. Eventually in 2000, I left Virginia, or I left the Boston area to work for Guido at a short-lived startup that was trying to, well, I don't know what they were trying to do. <laughs> it didn't work out, but I got to work on Python with Guido and uh, Fred Drake. That was like the Python Labs? Was that it? was Python Labs, yeah. Guido took his team from CNRI where he had been working and grabbed me from Virginia and we worked on that for half a year before that folded. How long did Python Labs last then? About half a year. Okay, but you have been involved in C Python development then for basically all the time then. Yeah. Yeah, back back around the time C was invented. <laughs> yeah, okay, since yeah. 91 or so. I was working at Kendall Square Research then. We were building custom hardware for a 64-bit parallel supercomputer. So I'm sure I did the first 64-bit port of Python which took less than a day, <laughs> uh, partly because we had a very clean architecture and C implementation, and partly because Guido had written very clean, portable code. There were only a few problems I had with that. Yeah. How did you hear of Python first? How did I hear? Well, you know, that's hard to tell. I probably heard about it from Christian Tismer. Oh. Uh, or a mailing list. Yeah, I think it was something like in 2003 or so, uh, some some mailing list flurries started about it, but I think even in 2004 you were at least mentioned in the EU proposal, so you had some, you had some closer contact there. Yeah, I had talked with Laura Creighton about it. There was some possibility I, I might work on it, but that was very uncertain. Yeah. And as it turned out, the funding took so long to be granted that my work situation had changed so that I couldn't accept the, the offer. Yeah, it's still a long, ongoing process, actually. <laughs> and being a United States resident and the EU really wanting to give money to Europeans, that was a, another hang-up in the process. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they do give uh, money to European companies, and they can employ a bunch of people. I have an address. If they want to send me a check, we can <laughs> test this hypothesis. I mean, there's still possibilities. <laughs> Even, like, for the last, I don't know, I mean, the project last time, so. My background was in compiler development. I worked on that for 15 years. Although well, that was more than 15 years ago, so it's hard to say that's still my background. The interesting thing is that it is a research project of which there is very little in the United States funding. I think it's great that the European Union funded a somewhat speculative project, despite that Armin had proved that you could do many things with his Psycho compiler for Python. It was still a speculative project, and I think it's great it got funded. That's what's exciting to me about it. Yeah. You get to play with things that may not work out, but they are cutting edge intellectual challenges, the things you're doing in the areas of manipulating object spaces and optimizing in weird and wonderful ways that go beyond the traditional compiler technology I was schooled in. That's what's interesting to me, the intellectual challenge of it all. Yeah. It's also fascinating to me that it's very hard to get something funded that like that by any means in the United States. Mm -hmm. So corporations have pretty much stopped funding researches and government agencies are pretty much driven by defense spending. 
I don't know that we can actually well, make I'm a case sure that I'm sure there's a twist where you can where you can tweak it so that it's very important for defense. Oh, absolutely. I think all the <laughs> nuclear arsenal should be under control of a Python program. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure, actually. With split-second timing. And we hope the garbage collector doesn't create a delay while they're pushing the button. <laughs> One of the hard times we have is actually, what I, what I realize now is that the EU does not fully realize how challenging the project actually is. I don't think... Like in, in the recent review report we just got today or so, they did not even particularly mention or yet here an emphasis in the review report on the just in time compiler for example. Are the management layers in this technically aware? Would they even know what a just in time compiler meant? Well I think on our side mostly yes. Yes? Okay. But um, on the EU side, I mean well, I mean like our project officer deals with like thirty projects at a time. Well the fifteen years I was working in compilers, I was working for hardware manufacturers. And in those days, the Pentium was not a dominant architecture. It was a best of joke. It was, you know, well, there wasn't a Pentium. There were little x86 chips that were very feeble. I worked in the scientific supercomputer biz. They hired compiler departments not because they loved languages, because it sold their hardware. The faster we could uh, make a Fortran program run, the better that was for them when they were selling a $20 million machine. Right. Uh, most of the people I know who worked in compiler development aren't in it anymore because the diversity in architectures has shrunk to almost nothing. Therefore, you don't have the hardware manufacturers funding compiler development in order to sell their hardware. Therefore, people get out of compiler development. Right. So um, I think that's probably a worldwide phenomenon, too. Right. My impression is that, especially the US-based uh, C Python developers, they do have an interest in Python and follow it and want to see how it like succeeds and all, including Guido. I know, but they seem to be hesitant to like get very close to it. Mm. And, and I'm wondering, I mean, is, is that true? And, and if so, why? Mm, I think many developers are overemployed. <laughs> yeah. They don't have spare bandwidth for anything beyond their own their own niche, what they're working on. Uh, the last five years I've been working at a company that did not really support Python development directly except as it intersected with their direct immediate interests. Right. And it's not that I didn't pay attention to PyPy itself, I didn't pay much attention to CPython for the last several years. Just didn't have time. And I suspect that is true of many other people. I suspect it's also true that people don't have a clear idea of what PyPy is or does. Yes. <laughs> I think they don't. And Part of that is a victim of the political machinations that were needed to get the EU funding, where one day it was sold as a JIT compiler, the next day it was sold as a, a, some magical solution for tiny embedded devices, and next it was a general purpose research platform for all sorts of ideas with no particular focus. Yes. And that carries on today. I attended uh, Michael Hudson's talk on PyPy, and at the end <laughs> he was asked what the major goal was. Yeah, yeah. And he completely froze. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There was a laugh of recognition in the audience because I think the audience expected that. They're not really sure what PyPy Pi is. So it was at least offended. Yeah, that, that's not a technical problem. That's a marketing problem. You need people to, to come up with a story for what you're doing and stick to it consistently. Mm -hmm. Whether that's it's true. true or not, people will believe it. Yeah. I mean, it's also true that I mean, we are hesitant to actually like go out and say, you know, this is the next generation Python version also because, also because we don't want to cause like competition. So, so far the whole Python community as I perceive it is very cooperative. Oh, yeah. Even when it comes to like talking to Jim Huggerman regarding Iron Python or sure. talking to Vigo regarding C Python or other C Python developers, um, still I'm sometimes wondering like, okay, there could be like three or four people who are previously involved in C Python development. Taking part, um, just because it's an opportunity, you're not here, here all the time. So, right. Um, that's a bit of a pity, and I'm, I'm not sure if we are doing something wrong, or if it's maybe even that that perspective from like US versus Europe, which we of course, because it's a new, a new proposal, we had to build this up a bit. Right. Right. We could not say it's a worldwide project, blah blah. blah. Although that's right. actually how we would like to have it. Uh, I, I would have loved to sit in the PyPy Pi sprint too, but 
as I mentioned before, the job I've had did not support Python development directly. And that's been years, and I quit that job. Yeah. <laughs> I was just eager to do something with Python again, because I haven't. And actually, I promised to do some things a year ago that I feel obligated to finish today. Yeah. So, you know, any day you ask, it's, a, it's another excuse. But yeah. it's still too much to do and too little time. I, I don't think there's much sense of uh, competition either. Well, maybe this is like Python 3000. Yeah. And all this. And since then, he seems to have gotten more and more of a distance, which I believe is mostly just also due to time pressure and all. Yeah. But he also seems to have taken now uh, this decision now. It stays with C, and even Python 3000 is going to be C based. I haven't actually talked to him in this conference, but. Well, he's sticking to what he knows because he feels some pressure to assure the community that Python 3000 isn't just a pipe dream and it will be there. So the more uncertainties you throw at a large user base, the more jittery they become. Uh, fine by me if CPython goes away. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things you mentioned is that you are able to do things in a pluggable way. We have a very large and delicate C code base now, which despite being very well written, has the brutality of age. I have spent yeah. the three days of sprints at this conference working on one patch to the the small object allocator, which is a small part of the overall memory management system. And it is so complex and the C-level coding has gotten so delicate, it's very hard to make progress. Uh, if you think about replacing that with an entirely different system, the mind boggles at how much work that would take. Mm -hmm. Coding in C is a very painful and error-prone experience. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually an interesting question. It's, it's like the way we are at the moment envisioning this is, is uh, we'll be able to help with that. I would think so. I mean, especially if we get to the simulation, if we can actually have the I mean, we yeah. have this GC simulation that Carl from Sports uh, wrote and some of code in Google last year. Right. So the GC simulation layer, and we're basically progressing now to integrate this into the translatable version of PyPy. Right. So that you can have, on the one hand, you can, have, can simulate garbage collection um, algorithms uh, with your pipe. Which would and be then, great. And then after that, if that works, you can tweak it a bit to actually have it work in your real um, executable. Yeah, and that's, that's just an example. Yeah. Uh, since we're at PyCon, it's become a yearly sprint to work on the AST branch, yeah. <laughs> which is attempting to replace what is probably the best known parts of compiler technology in existence. <laughs> Parsing is a very old and known and well-known problem. How's sprint-based development been working for you? That's pretty innovative too. Yeah, it is. It's actually been, that's going on quite well. I mean, we have been just like in early February this month. Um, Do you get a decent been... number of newcomers? Dropping in? Yeah. Because that's, that's what keeps sprints healthy and moving, and yes. otherwise you burn yes, out on them. We do have a distinction by now between uh, first contact sprints, where we are really sure. inviting ah. lots of people to okay. come us. Yeah. Like, for example, in, in the beginning of April, we have a different sprint. There, we are really moving very much towards a milestone, very yeah. much moving yeah. towards our like, contractual obligations. And uh, there, we are not welcoming newcomers. Really. So, we, there, we do expect people to have. Either deep knowledge of Python and right. C Python or so, right. or have already attained, attended uh, Python. Yeah. And, but mostly it's open, open sprints. Right. That's something that evolved by now. And as to the marketing, yes, I mean, we have quite a lot of interest. Like uh, we were at Iona in Ireland and, and several universities who are researchers actually working that way now, sprinting, you know? Right. right. And there's, I think there's Intel interested and there's. Uh, like recently, there's, there's like Greenpeace and, and whatnot. Yeah, they, they have a development group as well. And, cool. You know, so this, I mean, and Beatrice is, is doing a lot in like advertising. This, this is working quite well. <clears throat> yeah, there's all sorts of styles. You, went to the, you saw the Python core sprint here. This is one extreme. We're all sitting at our own computer and barely talk to each other. <laughs> We've got our own little areas of expertise and we're plugging away at them. <laughs> But it's still very productive. Yeah, at, at, at the evening, right? Yeah. yeah, and then we socialize. That's also nice. Sometimes I look up and realize, gosh, that he's been sitting there for four hours and I didn't even notice he came in. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still productive because we're everyone's working, yeah, 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 yeah. working yeah, hard. Take the time. Our telephone calls, there aren't people bugging you. <laughs> uh, what do you think about the latest 2.5? 
same thing. I was so unmoved by them, I didn't pay much attention to the discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't feel any particular need for them for myself. Maybe other people do, that's fine. Mm -hmm. They're not massively invasive, so I don't think they, they do much damage to the language, and that's good enough for me. Right. If you look at the implementation and all the new methods it introduced under the covers, it's ugly. Yeah. You see what it translates into, it, it's bizarre, and it's, but people won't work with it at that level, and it will. The problem, for example, which was a motivating example he gave of acquiring a lock and making sure you release it no matter what happens, yeah, is error prone and long winded, and the with statement will handle that just fine. Yeah. Well, there, you want to know what the, uh, the community thinks of, of PyPy. I think to many of them it's an extension of Stackless, just because <laughs> Christian Tismer is associated with it. Yeah, but so it's I also true that it's an extension of Cycle, so. Uh, an extension of what? Of, of Cycle. Also, oh, yeah. yeah. As well. So sometimes it's a bit, it's a bit boring that basically everybody pretends it's all just about speed. There's a saying in many parts of the computer business that the fast drives out the good. Well, I'm, I'm optimistic that attitudes towards speed have gotten more realistic as I've been growing older. As people realize now that programmers' time costs a lot more than computers. Right. And the computers I was cutting my teeth on cost $20 million a piece, not $20. Right. So that human time has become much more important. Right. And even for performance intensive applications, uh, People are becoming increasingly aware that there are different parts, some of which you couldn't care less how slow they go because the core of it is what really consumes the time. Do you think like free threading is, would be an important venue to follow? Uh, for who? <laughs> for us. <laughs> no, as, an, as a feature, basically. And do you think it's... it's uh... Yeah, you know, with... <laughs> I worked in the, in the vector and parallel scientific supercomputer biz for 15 years, <coughs> and the most unqualified success we had was the Unix make program, <coughs> because it could compile all its targets in parallel, and on a 128 processor machine with 128 modules, they could all compile at once, yes. and we could build our OS kernel in two minutes, yes. and then we would spend half an hour waiting for it to link, <laughs> because that was the bottleneck. Parallelism is very hard to work with. It is a dimension of thought that most people have no clue how to approach. It right. takes years and seat of the pants and, and all sorts of problems to work with threads. If you can hide it, it's great. The most practical parallelism is still if you have two separate processes because they don't step on each other's data spaces. They don't have intimate race conditions on every other line. Uh, for okay. most applications, I think it's practical. Right. Okay, but I think when it comes to like pure computation tasks, yeah, then, then people are generally to get the speed they want going to have to write them very painfully by hand anyway. Yes, unless they're very regular matrix computations, then then it's no problem. Right, <clears throat> you can implement those, but matrices are regular and real life is lumpy, and there's not a very good fit there for an awful lot of tasks people want to do. There are all those masses of exceptions you have to deal with, and that's very hard to do right in parallel when one stage is depending on the next, and you got to wait for the lumps to get ironed out before you move to the next stage. Right. This parallel design is hard. On the other hand, they're running out of things to do with silicon and hardware, and you're going to be seeing multiple core CPUs. Uh, I guess two core CPUs are going to become common very soon, and then four. And I expect there won't be an end to that for a decade, and they'll have 128 core CPUs. What do you do with all that stuff? Yes. Run 128 separate programs is the best way to use it. <laughs> <laughs> like Bert and no, Smith. Yeah, then, then it's probably true that <laughs> going for some kind of transparent distribution of, of stuff between them. Or do they all have to cooperate on the same task? And that's an interesting right. question. One of the few supercomputer companies that, that survived a long time was Burton Smith's uh, Terra Computer or he did a hardware design which had a essentially zero cycle context switches. Uh, every cycle you could be running a different thread from a different process and there was no penalty for switching between them. That was a throughput machine. If you had 20 jobs running at the same time and he had duplicated the hardware resources 20 times, they all ran full speed. And the latency where somebody was waiting 10 cycles to get something from memory, each of those 10 cycles 10 other programs would run. 
Uh, that was a very practical and clever approach. <laughs> Free threading is interesting. Uh, it's a dead. It's it's dead in the water for C Python. C Python will never have it, just because of its reference count based approach means you have such heavy fine grained locking. Um, it just slows it down. Yeah. Well, it would be a distinguishing feature. Then. Yes, it would. I mean, many people are asking for it. And are they asking for manual control over it, or do they want you to make use of threads by magic for them? Well, I think, I don't know. It's not that specific yet. They, they will ask for both. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's only the people who are willing to do it by <laughs> hand that are, that are going to be really happy. Right. And then as their programs get large and the threading issues overwhelm them, and they start using things like Python's Q class, which pretty much takes away any advantage of having free threading because it serializes everything. Well, it depends on the, on the <laughs> time you take to compute. Yeah, there's a whole fascinating class of algorithms that work well with threads. Yeah. But they take effort. Yeah. More than most programmers want to put into it. And Python's appeal is it makes the programmer's life easy. I happen to think threading in Python is easier than, than in almost any language I've used. But it's partly because the semantics are at such a high level and we've hidden most of the race problems with the global interpreter lock so that when C code is running, nothing bad is going to happen. Two people can muck with the dick at the same time, it's never going to blow up. It might not give them the dick they expected in the end, but it's not going to sink fault. Yeah. Okay, so some last wishes for Pi Pi? Would you... I would like to wish it a happy birthday. Ah. <laughs> and I'd like to get a cake yes. and balloons and noisemakers and have a big party. Are you going to do, to do that like in January, February next year? So. Yeah, win or lose, you have to have a party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A milestone. Yeah, thanks a lot. Sure. For talking. When do they start cameraing us? When? Yeah, when does she start filming? I don't know. When did you start? <laughs> From the beginning. Ah. Oh, you're kidding! This was on. <laughs> this was on camera. <laughs> now I'm gonna freeze up and get tongue tied. <laughs> <laughs>